Happy Friday. Our last, it is Friday, yeah. Woo! Our last Friday together, at least this term. So, the Socratic activity you're working on, please jump on it if you haven't started yet. I know some of you just trickled in, which is totally fine. Please work on that, it's worth a point. At the end of class, or you can flip ahead to this last slide now if you want to, I'll break down how many points are left to earn in the semester, including the points that are available today. Does anybody have any questions before we get started? I've heard a lot of good discussions about pedigrees while you were taking this exercise on Socratic, which is fantastic. And that's where we're headed today. We're going to start with dominance, and then we're going to move into pedigree analysis. We'll probably wrap up this set of slides on Monday. Any questions or concerns? <clears throat> okay. So we'll talk about the answers to this Socrative quiz probably on Monday, because I want to make sure everybody's got the background, and I'm going to look at your responses and see where we need to focus more efforts on Monday for pedigree analysis. First, talk a little bit about Last class, we talked about Mendel's first law, monohybrid cross, which is a heterozygote crossed to a heterozygote. Het, cross, het. And we did a little bit of phenotype ratio, genotype ratio analysis. The one we looked at was the Punnett square from a monohybrid cross, where if there were, for example, the gene we were looking at had big A and little a, then there would be a one to two to one genotype ratio one homozygous capital A, two heterozygote, and one homozygous little a. And assuming, this is what we're talking about today, assuming, and it is true that geneticists tend to use capital letters to indicate dominant alleles, assuming that A is dominant, that one to two to one genotype ratio turns into a three to one phenotype ratio with any of the individuals having a capital A, one copy or two, having the dominant trait and the homozygous recessive individual having the recessive trait, whatever that is. For those of you that worked on the Punnett square exercise, I didn't have a chance I didn't take the time to go through and look at everybody's responses. So in case you were the one of the people that I didn't specifically give feedback to, I wanted to provide the key to that exercise. This was the cross I talked about last class where we had two worms that were heterozygous for GFP. So they had a GFP transgene, capital G, on one of their chromosomes and nothing on the other chromosome. And if you cross those, you expect to see that one to two to one ratio that totals the total number of worms. We talked about that in class last time. That would mean you expect three and a half hetero homozygous capital G, seven heterozygotes, and three and a half homozygous nothing, no GFP gene. Some of you had questions about this, and I'm not sure that the people that actually had questions about this that they posted on Google Classroom are here now, but just to remind you, decimals are okay. It's okay to have, you expect to see three and a half worms that are homozygous G. It's not biologically meaningful. That's not a thing that actually exists, a worm that has the, a half a worm. The important point for the chi-square test, though, as we discussed before, is that the number of expected worms has to total the same as the number of observed worms. And the only way to do that is to have fractional worms in this case. So you don't round, because if you round, that would be what? You'd round up to four in both of those cases, and then you'd, ex you'd have a total of 15 worms, and that throws off the chi-square test. Does anybody have other questions about this? That's the chi-square value I calculated. Most of you, at least, got the increase in the number of degrees of freedom here. We've got three different genotype categories. So this is one of those cases where degree of freedom is not always one. Because if you've got three categories minus one, you've got degrees of freedom of two. And should have gotten a p-value greater than 0 0.05, which means that the observed values are not statistically different from a one to two to one ratio. So three to 10 to one is indistinguishable statistically from a one to two to one ratio. 
I love it, I honestly do, when people correct me when I make a mistake. So last class, I did make a mistake, although we didn't talk about this in detail. But somebody came up after class and said, you know, I don't think that thing when you talked about what salmon would be like if there was a tetraploid organism and what the Punnett square would look like. So I want to make a brief correction to what I said. And I think what I was talking about was the number of squares that would be in a tetraploid Punnett square. I think, if I remember correctly, I said 4 by 4 because tetraploid. It's not 4 by 4 because tetraploid. So if you're a tetraploid organism, let's say there's a gene A, and there are four different versions of it. So there's A1, A2, A3, and A4. Tetraploid organism, four copies of every chromosome, so it's possible to have four different versions of any particular gene. The place where I didn't think properly last class was what does the gamete look like after a tetraploid cell goes through meiosis? How many copies of every chromosome will be in a salmon, sperm, or egg, in this case, to any tetraploid organism? Is it two? Why is it two? If you start with four copies of a chromosome and you do synthesis, that doubles, you have eight copies of every chromosome. And then the first division of meiosis would reduce that in half to four. The second division would reduce it in half again to two. So in every salmon sperm, there are going to be two copies of each chromosome. They're going to have diploid gametes because a diploid egg and a diploid sperm have to meet to recreate the tetraploid salmon. So that means that there are a lot more combinations. No, we're not talking about a Punnett square that has four different categories. How many different combinations of two alleles can you have if there are four different alleles? You could have A1 with itself. So you could have a 1 with a 1. That is one gamete, one sperm or one egg, like we could. You could have a single chromosome go into a gamete. Well, they can have two copies of chromosome 1 go into a gamete, or one with 2, or one with 3, or one with 4, or 2 with 2, 2 with 3, 2 with 4. Remember, so these are the haplotypes <coughs> of the gametes. You're going to have two copies of every chromosome in a diploid gamete, and they're going to come in all combinations. So what else do we have left? Three and four, and three and three, and four and four. So ten different possible genotypes, haplotypes of sperm or eggs that tetraploid organisms could produce. So that means there's going to be a ten by ten Punnett square, and that's the correction to what I said last time. It would definitely not be four by four. It would be a ten by ten Punnett square. No, that will not be on the final. Maybe knowing how to calculate the number of rows and columns in a Punnett square would be. I wouldn't make you fill it in. It would take you the whole exam period. All right, back to the kitties. Just a few vocabulary items. And what we're mainly going to focus on here is trying to understand how a geneticist can tell experimentally whether or not an allele is dominant or recessive to another allele. So this is a category of genetics called epistasis and gene-gene interactions, how two different alleles of a gene work together in the cell. So here's a thought question. We talked about this brachydactyly example last time, where last time we talked, capital B was dominant, and brachydactyly is a dominant disease. If there's a dominant mutation, if you get one dominant mutation, then you're brachydactylous. So in this case, the individual in the upper left has brachydactyly. None of the other 19 genotypes up here that are all homozygous wild type, homozygous recessive, are normal, don't have brachydactyly. What would this 
look like if lowercase b was dominant? That is, if brachydactyly was a recessive disease. If capital B is recessive and lowercase b was dominant, how would that change what these people look like? What would all the lowercase b over lowercase b individuals look like? They would just be the same? They'd be the same. So in this case, the capital B allele still causes brachydactyly, but it's recessive. They would all just be the same. Everybody would be, including the person in the upper left. If capital B, if lowercase b was dominant, and dominant is the wild type trait, no brachydactyly, then every one of the 20 people indicated up there would not have brachydactyly. So what do we call that person if they're heterozygous for a recessive allele? Particular term we use in genetics, carrier. An individual that doesn't have the trait but has the possibility of passing it on. So if we flip all the nomenclature and say lowercase b is dominant, and uppercase B is recessive, then we have a carrier. An individual that has one mutation that can be passed on and passed on and passed on, but doesn't itself cause the disease because it's recessive. It has to be homozygous. So what would that cross look like in this example? What are the phenotypes of the offspring in this cross? They would all either be wild type or carriers. So you have capital B and lowercase b and lowercase b and lowercase b. So how many of these capital B over lowercase b? So if lowercase b is dominant, All of these people have a lowercase b, so they'd all be wild type. wild type if capital B or lowercase b is dominant, if capital B is recessive. So in a recessive, in this obviously doesn't make sense for brachydactyly because we know it's a dominant disease. But we are going to be looking at recessive disorders, so that, that's where we're heading with this example, is we go from the situation where there are no individuals in this generation that have this trait, they're all wild type, they all have one copy of the dominant allele, lowercase b. They've all got at least one. What does it take for that recessive trait to show up? To, to homozygous, for the homozygous for the recessive allele. So how do we get somebody who's capital B over capital B from the four individuals we have in this generation? Two carriers, two heterozygotes. The only way to get two capital Bs together in a kid is to have two carriers cross. And in this case, that would be two siblings, because these are all offspring from the same parents. This is why you should not have sex with your brothers and sisters, or first cousins, or maybe even second cousins, or aunts and uncles, cousins, because we know, and genetics have been known for centuries, that mm, decades, a century, that if there's a recessive mutation that's passed along in your family tree, then you're more likely to have individuals, offspring, that have the recessive trait appear if you happen to mate with somebody else who has the recessive version of that gene. And that's more likely, if, you, if it's a heritable disease, if it's one that runs in families, you're more likely to have a kid that has both parents contributing that mutation if you're mating with somebody that's closely related to you. Likewise, of course, it is also true that you wouldn't want to have a kid with somebody from another family that had the same mutation, but that's harder to avoid. It's easy to tell people don't mate with your siblings. Except for now we live in the era of genetic testing where it would actually maybe be feasible to, as we discussed a couple weeks ago, the Nigeria um, mandatory genetic testing before dating talked about that a month ago, I think. All right, you could do genetic testing on your boyfriend, girlfriend, significant other. Make sure you've got compatible genes.
Pure breeding, the purebred dog. So in order to be able to test for dominant or recessiveness of alleles, we have to start with pure breeding lines of individuals. So we could have white flowers whose genotype is capital W over capital W. What does it mean if they're pure breeding? It means that you mate two of those same phenotype individuals together. What do their kids look like if they're pure breeding? They're all white. That's the definition of pure breeding. It doesn't mean pure. It doesn't mean white. It means they're all the same. They all look the same. They have the same trait. And in this case, we can already tell genetically why that would be. Why is that? What, what's the genetic characteristic of the parents in this case that ensure that all their kids look the same? They're both going to have the same copies of the two alleles. Right. There's no genetic variation in either of the parents. They're both homozygous. They're both homozygous for the same allele. Capital W over capital W and capital W over capital W. That is how we know that they're pure breeding. You mate two individuals together that have the same trait and all of their offspring look identical to the parents, then that's pure breeding. So in other words, pure breeding basically means homozygous. And we know that organisms are homozygous without actually getting their DNA and studying their DNA by just mating together and looking at their offspring. So same with the red flowers. We could have red flowers. They're lowercase w over lowercase w. But we, know, we don't know that yet. We don't know that they're homozygous until we cross them together and look at their offspring. If their offspring are all identical, that lets us infer that the parents were homozygous. So observing the phenotypes in the F1 tells us about the genotypes of the parents. If there's no genetic diversity in the F1s, that must mean that the parents were both homozygous, which is also called breeding true, if you've heard that phrase before. We've got dominance, we've got recessiveness, and then there's incomplete dominance. This is the only other type of dominance. There are lots of types of dominance we're going to talk about. We're just going to talk about pure dominance and then incomplete dominance. So in this case, why is that F1 flower pink and not red or white? If this is evidence that the parents are not pure breeding. They're not purebred. They're not breeding true because there's some variation in the offspring. The most common story to tell and the reason that flowers are often used is because we know that there are enzymes that create pigments in plants and that in this case, for example, we might have the lowercase allele, the lowercase w, being a gene that encodes a protein that converts a white enzyme or white substrate into red a reddish pigment. So if you've got a heterozygote, it's got one lowercase w. That makes some pigment from, that's white turn red. And if you've got a homozygote for lowercase w, that means it's got twice as many of those genes producing probably twice as many of those enzymes. So it's converting more white substrate into that red pigment. So the flower looks darker red. So in this case, the darker red flower parent would be a lowercase w over lowercase w. It's got twice as many alleles of this lowercase w allele that actually can produce red pigment. The white flower would be the capital W over capital W. It doesn't have any of this enzyme, so it can't convert any of the white substrate to any amount of red, so it just looks white. And then why is 
their offspring pink. What's its genotype? Capital W over lowercase w, which produces some red pigment, but not as much as the parent. So that's one way that incomplete dominance can occur. If you can actually tell the difference phenotypically between parents that are homozygous and parents and individuals that are heterozygous. If it's purely dominant, what would the heterozygote look like? Or would it? What does the capital W allele do? Here, like before, I've switched the nomenclature on you. The capital W allele doesn't do anything. It's recessive. It's the lowercase w that converts white pigment into something that's pink. So how do you assess allele dominance? <coughs> Bless you. You want to start with pure breeding individuals, and then what? What is a what is a dominant hybrid look like? It look like which parent? So let's say we were assessing the dominance of allele capital B. If you crossed two pure breeding individuals, one, let's say capital B makes blue. It should be easy to remember. And capital B, or lowercase b over lowercase b does not. Make some other colored flower. What is the offspring going to look like if capital B is dominant? What's the phenotype? Blue. Blue. So the phenotypes of the parents in this case would be blue and not blue, something else. What does it look like if capital B is recessive? Make the same genotype, just a different scenario. So here, capital B is recessive. It makes a blue plant, but only if you're, heteros or if you're homozygous capital B. So what does the offspring look like in the recessive case, where capital B is recessive to lowercase b? Not, it's the other phenotype. It looks like the other parent, not blue. So what does it look like in incomplete? If capital B is incompletely dominant, in the F1 generation, what does that offspring from the same cross look like? Like light blue. You're right, sure, light blue. Somewhere between blue and not blue, <laughs> whatever that means. Dashed blue. Right. Some sort of combination of the parent traits. So this is how to tell which allele is dominant. Take two pure breeding parents that are, have a different trait, and you just look in the offspring. Which parent does the offspring look like? That tells you which allele is dominant. The offspring doesn't look blue, it means that whichever parent had the same trait has the dominant allele. And the other allele, in that case, is by definition recessive. think about this one. 
If lowercase w is dominant, what's the offspring going to look like? Would it? If, if lowercase w is dominant, this offspring is what genotype? Capital W, lowercase w, and if lowercase w is incomplete, is incomplete, is dominant, then it's going to look like whatever organism the phenotype is of not the capital W, but lowercase w. So if lowercase w is dominant, it would look red. Another application of taking two pure breeding parents, looking at the hybrid offspring, Compare its phenotype to the parents, and that tells you what's dominant and what's recessive. In other words, it would be nice if you were able to do this both directions. Predict the phenotype of offspring based on what I would tell you about the dominance of alleles, or vice versa, predict the dominance of alleles based on phenotype. Let's take a look at examples in humans of dominant and recessive phenotypes. Maybe it'll make it a little bit more relevant. And the goal here is to not just predict or understand dominance and recessiveness and which allele is which, but to figure out at the molecular level that is inside the cell when the gene becomes the protein, why would that protein act in a dominant or recessive manner? So dominance, dominance is a genetic phenomenon, but the effect is a phenotypic effect. Color flower, change, something, and all due to the action of proteins. So take, for example, Huntington, which is a protein that causes, has a mutation that causes Huntington's disease. It's a human neurological disorder. Now here's all the story you need to know about Huntington. It's a transcription factor. So the, what does transcription factor do? It, what does it bind? What, what other molecules do transcription factors interact with? RNA Some interact with RNA polymerase. They interact with DNA or other proteins to start transcription. So this is a gene whose job it is is to go around the cell and turn on transcription of particular sets of genes. And it has this region of the protein that has repeats of the same triplet of nucleotides over and over again, CAG. And in our nomenclature, we would call that, sometimes they're CAG 20, like 20 repeats or so of this trinucleotide repeat in a row. It turns out that DNA polymerase kind of sucks at replicating triplets or dinucleotide repeats, microsatellites as we know them. And sometimes it'll make a mistake and accidentally add a repeat or take out a repeat. So you'll go from maybe dad is CAG 20, mom, or your his kid is CAG 19, maybe the grandkid's CAG 22. Yeah. So these trinucleotide repeats tend to change pretty rapidly from generation to generation in size. These encode the amino acid glutamine. And it turns out that when you have proteins that have lots of glutamines in a row, the same amino acid glutamine over and over and over again, biochemists refer to this as sort of a sticky protein. It turns out that proteins that have these long strings of glutamines tend to tangle up with each other. When they're translated and they become proteins, as they're folding, they tend to incorrectly fold and bind other proteins and cause huge tangles of proteins inside the cell. And in theory, that's why neurodegeneration occurs. In neurons, they're particularly susceptible to when all the proteins get tangled up and can't fold properly, the neurons start to die and then you get neurodegenerative diseases. Same thing, similar things happen in Alzheimer's and other sorts of neurodegenerative diseases. This is a dominant mutation. And the mutation in the case of Huntington's disease is not that you have 20 repeats. That's actually normal. It's when the repeat number gets to like 30 to 40 plus 
glutamines in a row, CAG, 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 CAG. Normal Huntington protein, the way it's normally designed, the gene itself, is meant to encode about 20 glutamines. But when you get too many, then that starts to cause neurodegeneration. So the mutation here is an expansion in the number of CAGs in the gene. It's dominant. Most mutations to BRCA1, which causes predisposition to breast cancer, are recessive. We talked about this before. BRCA1 is an enzyme that's involved in DNA repair. So that means that people that are heterozygous are OK. They're still susceptible to breast cancer, but it's worse if you're homozygous for the recessive mutation. The last one is another enzyme, hexaminidase, hexosaminidase, blah. that's a good thing, I'm not a biochemist. Mutations cause Tay-Sachs disease, which is a heritable disease, and it causes buildup of particular sphingolipids inside the neurons. It also causes neurodegeneration. You think it's dominant or recessive? What would it look like if you were a heterozygote? Because that's what that's all dominance and recessiveness is about. Is what does the heterozygote look like? What's the ability of their cells to function? Turns out this is also recessive. Why would this mutation be recessive? What's the property of a heterozygote that allows them to be normal wild type? So why is it that a heterozygote with this sort of mutation, there's, a, there's an enzyme. You can either have two copies of it, plus over plus, or you can have one functional copy, plus over minus, which is the heterozygote. So why is a heterozygote OK? doesn't have the disease. What about being heterozygous is OK? Yeah. Being heterozygous is OK for this one, uh, because you have one gene that uh, has or one, sorry, one allele that has activity of hexa and one that doesn't, but you still have one with the activity. OK. That is the concept of, yeah, that we're looking at. That you still have one wild type gene. And in some cases, it's enough to produce one copy, one amount, one allele's worth of protein that are enzymes. Right? That one wild type copy can still produce the normal enzyme. That normal enzyme can still do the normal cellular functions. This person maybe just has half as much of that enzyme, a heterozygote. Homozygote recessive or homozygote for that mutation makes no enzyme, can't clear the sphingolipids from, or can't clear the gangliosides from their cells, so they develop the disease. That's why this is recessive. Question? I was just going to ask if they like, were less effective at it, but you can make it better. So it tends to be the case that these are sort of a lot of recessive mutations have a threshold where maybe 50% of the protein is okay, but maybe 40% wouldn't be okay. So there's going to be some gray area in there. So we just talked about one of the recessive diseases. What about the other one? Breast cancer. One, mutations are recessive. That's a DNA repair enzyme. So why would mutations in a DNA repair enzyme probably be recessive? If you're heterozygote, you're OK. Same answer. If you're heterozygous for a BRCA1 mutation, you still have one copy that can do the job of DNA repair. Maybe you don't do it as effectively with half as much protein BRCA1, but most of the time, maybe that's enough. So heterozygote is generally indistinguishable from a homozygote in disease. Yeah. So um, to make sure I understand, um, yeah. when we're talking about uh, 
whether uh, it's dominant or recessive, it has to do with whether or not the presence or the uh, the presence of the of what would you call that? I guess the, like if there were an enzyme or not an enzyme, that's what depends on and, and what it does too. Right. So that brings us to let's clarify it. Get back to me in class if we haven't solved this by the time we talk about the dominant mutation and how it differs from the two recessive mutations. So the dominant mutation that we talked about just now was Huntington, which is abbreviated HTT. Causes it to do what again? Mutant HTT has too many CAGs. Now what's the effect inside the cell? makes other proteins tangle up and causes general protein <coughs> malfunction inside the cell. So why would that be dominant? They still have one wild type copy of, if you're heterozygous, you still have one wild type copy of Huntington. So what is it about this mutation that causes this to be a dominant effect? The enzyme can dominate the recessive Yes, but what, and the point is, what's the effect inside the cell? This is not recessive. A heterozygote, this is dominant. A heterozygote gets the disease. It's because you only need one bad apple to spoil the bunch, if I can use an analogy in a weird way. Because this mutation has gained a function. That is, it's not that we've lost the function, that's typical of recessive mutations, that they used to do a job, but they don't anymore because of the mutation. But that's okay because you still got one wild type copy of the gene. So it tends to be that recessive mutations are where the, a wild type function of whatever gene we're talking about has been lost. That is, it doesn't do something bad to the cell that you lost the function of the gene. There's still a backup copy on the other homolog. But when a mutation causes a protein or a gene and a protein, for the first time to do something new that it's never done before, then that is often a dominant mutation. Like, it's only, it only takes one bad Huntington protein to start tangling up other proteins in the cell, and then everything goes haywire. You don't have to have both versions of Huntington be mutant. It just takes one. So it's hard to predict, and we're not going to be asking you to predict whether or not any particular type of mutation that I would describe would be dominant or recessive, because there's a lot more detail to it than just is it gain of function or loss of function. But this is a general trend, that if a mutation knocks out, gets rid of a function of a gene, that's usually recessive, because there's a backup copy. So what I'm asking you to know is that concept, gain of function, loss of function, why it's typically true that loss of function mutations are recessive and why it could be true that gain-of-function mutations could be dominant. Pedigree time. The goals for this class and next class, then, are going to be be able to predict transmission patterns, now that we know a little bit about dominance and recessiveness. And once again, we may or may not get to, once again, the use of chi-square tests. This is one of the places where chi-square analysis is really important, because it can have real-world effects, especially if you do something like genetic counseling. So we'll see if we get there. Okay, quick review, because I heard some of you talking about it before class. Pedigree symbols. What do we have? Circle, circle gets the square. Squares and circles, which are? Males and females. What's the open, unfilled in symbol? Don't have the trait. Yeah, we'll call that wild type. Don't have the trait. Filled in. They have the trait. They're affected with whatever. Affected is maybe not the best word for it, because the trait that we're looking at is not always a disease. It's not always bad. It's just whatever phenotype we're tracking from generation to generation. They have it. 
And then for our purposes, the only other one we're going to really worry about is what if they're half filled in? Carrier? These are carriers. So this is a symbol that's specifically reserved for, so what's the genotype of a carrier? They're heterozygous, but they're heterozygous for a specific type of allele, recessive. In other words, the symbol is filled in to indicate that they pass that, they can pass that trait on, but they themselves don't have that trait. It's hidden. They're a carrier. They don't show the phenotype, but they have the ability to pass on the gene that can cause that phenotype. That's why it's half filled in. Really, it's a, de it's a description of their genotype. They're half, in this case, half white, half black. So if this was plus and minus, that would be the genotype. They're all heterozygotes, but for a recessive allele. Let's see. What would an autosomal dominant pattern look like? Drew this out in advance just for fun. Okay. So let's say that male and that male are both exist, experiencing this trait. They exhibit it. How is that going to be passed on into the next generations? Depends. So one dad passes his trait to all of his kids. The other dad passes his trait to half of his kids. And then the dad in generation two passes it to half of his kids. So what are the characteristics of this sort of pattern that indicate to us that it's dominant? There are a couple really important things, two or three. Every generation. So dominant tend, tend not to skip generations. Not always, but it's typical that an autosomal dominant trait will show up in every generation. That's what suggests dominance. It's not always true. I will show you the exceptions this class and next class, but it's almost always true. What suggests that it's autosomal instead of X or Y or cytoplasmic is that there's affects both sexes more or less equally. That is, it passes from males to females and then from females and males to both males and females. Those are the key points for autosomal dominant inheritance. But there are exceptions to that rule which we're going to look at next class. What about So in this example, I decided to have that individual affected and that one and that one. Just three individuals. So what typifies recessive inheritance? tends to skip generations, one or more. So it's not necessarily, in, can be in every generation, but not necessarily in every generation. And again, affects both females and males. So how did that mutation get from generation one to generation three? So if this, what's the genotype of the, of the individual one? If this is recessive, the homozygous, heterozygous, if this is a recessive mutation, they have to be homozygous for the recessive mutation, say minus over minus. They show the disease, but if the disease or trait is recessive, they have to be homozygous for the recessive mutation. So how did it show up again in the third generation? 
What are the parents of the parents here? What do they have to be for this disease to show up again in the third generation? They both have to be carriers, plus over minus. That's the only way to get affected individuals, minus over minus, back in the third generation. So we can predict then that both of those individuals, I'm horrible at half filling in circles and squares, but those are both carriers. So it was present in the first generation, absent in the second generation, then present again in the third generation. So we can't see carriers unless we actually get DNA from them and genotype them. But we can infer their presence when there's a disease in one generation and then it skips a generation but shows up again later. Let's do this. One Socrative activity. We'll talk about the results next time, but please do this now. We've got three minutes left in class. So once you're done with this, I'll take the last minute to talk about points available for the rest of the semester and then what to do for next class.